Lesson 3 The Everlasting Gospel Sabbath Afternoon April 8 God's work is the same in all time, although there are different degrees of development and different manifestations of His power to meet the wants of men in the different ages. Beginning with the first gospel promise and coming down through the patriarchal and Jewish ages and even to the present time, there has been a gradual unfolding of the purposes of God and the plan of redemption. The Savior typified in the rites and ceremonies of the Jewish law is the very same that is revealed in the gospel. The clouds that enveloped his divine form have rolled back, the mists and shades have disappeared, and Jesus, the world's Redeemer, stands revealed. He who proclaimed the law from Sinai and delivered to Moses the precepts of the ritual law is the same that spoke the Sermon on the Mount. The great principles of love to God, which he set forth as the foundation of the law and the prophets, are only a reiteration of what he had spoken through Moses to the Hebrew people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. Thou shalt love the Lord as thyself. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. The teacher is the same in both dispensations. God's claims are the same. The principles of his government are the same. For all proceed from him with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James chapter 1 verse 17. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 373. Christ is coming the second time, with power unto salvation. To prepare human beings for this event, he has sent the first, second, and third angels' messages. These angels represent those who receive the truth and with power open the gospel to the world. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 978. This message, the three angels' message, is a testing message. Received into honest hearts, it will prove an antidote for all the world's sins and sorrows. No conditions of climate, of poverty, of ignorance, or of prejudice can hinder its efficiency or lessen its adaptability to the needs of mankind. The proclamation of the great gospel message is the work of the disciples of Christ. Some will labor for this in one way, and others will carry another branch of the work, as the Lord calls and directs them individually. All have not the same line of work, but all may unite in their efforts. The word of the living God is to be proclaimed throughout the world. The gospel is to go forth with great power, marked by practical manifestations of the Spirit of God. Our workers are to become a living agency to reveal the purpose of God in calling them to His work. The word of the glorious gospel is to be preached in its divine comprehensiveness. By the living voice and by kind, compassionate deeds, we are to exemplify the principles of the gospel. The Upward Look, page 277. Sunday, April 9. A Grace-Filled Book of Hope. As false doctrines were urged in the early church, differences sprang up, and the eyes of many were turned from beholding Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith. The discussion of unimportant points of doctrine and the contemplation of pleasing fables of man's invention occupied time that should have been spent in proclaiming the gospel, and Satan seemed about to gain the ascendancy over those who claimed to be followers of Christ. It was at this critical time in the history of the church that John was sentenced to banishment. Never had his voice been needed by the church as now. Nearly all his former associates in the ministry had suffered martyrdom. The remnant of believers was facing fierce opposition. To all outward appearance, the day was not far distant when the enemies of the Church of Christ would triumph. But the Lord's hand was moving unseen in the darkness. In the providence of God, John was placed where Christ could give him a wonderful revelation of himself and of divine truth for the enlightenment of the churches. 
In exiling John, the enemies of truth had hoped to silence forever the voice of God's faithful witness. But on Patmos, the disciple received a message, the influence of which was to continue to strengthen the church till the end of time. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 580 and 581. The book of Revelation especially demands study. Let every God-fearing teacher consider how most clearly to comprehend and to present the gospel that our Savior came in person to make known to his servant John, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. None should become discouraged in the study of the revelation because of its apparently mystical symbols. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. James chapter 1, verse 5. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. When a real love for the Bible is awakened, and the student begins to realize how vast is the field and how precious its treasure, he will desire to seize upon every opportunity for acquainting himself with God's Word. Education, page 191. The church history upon the earth and the church redeemed in heaven all center around the cross of Calvary. This is the theme. This is the song. Christ all and in all in anthems of praise resounding through heaven from thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand and an innumerable company of the redeemed host. All unite in this song of Moses and of the Lamb. It is a new song, for it was never before sung in heaven. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 433. Monday April 10. The Everlasting Gospel. Everyone that is of the truth, Christ declared, heareth my voice. John chapter 18, verse 37. Having stood in the councils of God, having dwelt in the everlasting heights of the sanctuary, all elements of truth were in him and of him. He was one with God. It means more than finite minds can comprehend to present in every missionary effort Christ and Him crucified. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 Christ crucified for our sins. Christ risen from the dead. Christ ascended on high as our intercessor. This is the science of salvation that we need to learn and to teach. This is to be the burden of our work. The cross of Christ Teach it to every student over and over again. How many believe it to be what it is? How many bring it into their studies and know its true significance? Could there be a Christian in our world without the cross of Christ? Then keep the cross upheld as the foundation of true education. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, pages 22 and 23. Abundant grace has been provided that the believing soul may be kept free from sin. For all heaven with its limitless resources has been placed at our command. We are to draw from the well of salvation. Christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believeth. In ourselves we are sinners, but in Christ we are righteous. Having made us righteous through the imputed righteousness of Christ, God pronounces us just and treats us as just. He looks upon us as his dear children. Christ works against the power of sin, and where sin abounded, grace much more abounds. Therefore, being justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 394. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. The purpose and plan of grace existed from all eternity. Before the foundation of the world, it was according to the determinate counsel of God that man should be created, endowed with power to do the divine will. But the defection of man, with all its consequences, was not hidden from the omnipotent, and yet it did not deter him from carrying out his eternal purpose. For the Lord would establish his throne in righteousness. God knows the end from the beginning. Therefore redemption was not an afterthought, but an eternal purpose to be wrought out for the blessing not only of this atom of a world, but for the good of all the worlds which God has created. God's Amazing Grace, page 129. Tuesday, April 11. A Story of Grace. The message proclaimed by the angel flying in the midst of heaven is the everlasting gospel, the same gospel that was declared in Eden when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Here was the first promise of a Savior who would stand on the field of battle to contest the power of Satan and prevail against him. Christ came to our world to represent the character of God as it is represented in his holy law, for his law is a transcript of his character. Christ was both the law and the gospel. The angel that proclaims the everlasting gospel proclaims the law of God. For the gospel of salvation brings men to obedience of the law, whereby their characters are formed after the divine similitude. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 106. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19. The Word of God is the grand instrument which convicts the unconverted, convincing them of their need of the sin-pardoning Savior. The plan of salvation combines the holy influences of past and present light. These influences are bound together by the golden chain of loving obedience. Receiving Christ by faith and bowing in submission to God's will constitutes men and women sons and daughters of God. By the power which the Savior alone can give, they are made members of the royal family, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. To love God with all the heart, to be a partaker with Christ in His humiliation and suffering, means more than many understand. The atonement of Christ is the great central truth around which cluster all the truths that pertain to the great work of redemption. The mind of man is to blend with the mind of Christ. This union sanctifies the understanding, giving the thoughts clearness and force. Lift Him Up, page 229. It is the privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of His grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that Christ desires so much as agents who will represent to the world His spirit and character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and blessing to human hearts. Christ has made every provision that His church shall be a transformed body, illumined with the light of the world, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. It is His purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace. He desires that we shall reveal His own joy in our lives. 
the indwelling of the Spirit will be shown by the outflowing of heavenly love. The divine fullness will flow through the consecrated human agent to be given forth to others. Christ's Object Lessons, page 419. Wednesday, April 12, Into All the World The Jewish people had been made the depositaries of sacred truth, but Phariseeism had made them the most exclusive, the most bigoted of all the human race. Everything about the priests and rulers, their dress, customs, ceremonies, traditions, made them unfit to be the light of the world. They looked upon themselves, the Jewish nation, as the world. But Christ commissioned his disciples to proclaim a faith and worship that would have in it nothing of caste or country, a faith that would be adapted to all peoples, all nations, all classes of men. Christ commissioned his disciples to do the work he had left in their hands, beginning at Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been the scene of his amazing condescension for the human race. There he had suffered, been rejected, and condemned. The land of Judea was his birthplace. There, clad in the garb of humanity, he had walked with men, and few had discerned how near heaven came to the earth when Jesus was among them. At Jerusalem, the work of the disciples must begin. The Desire of Ages, pages 819 and 820. All who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. The heaven-born love of Christ must find expression. Those who have put on Christ will relate their experience, tracing step by step the leadings of the Holy Spirit, their hungering and thirsting for the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ whom He has sent, the results of their searching of the Scriptures, their prayers, their soul agony, and the words of Christ to them, Thy sins be forgiven thee. It is unnatural for any to keep these things secret, and those who are filled with the love of Christ will not do so. In proportion as the Lord has made them the depositaries of sacred truth will be their desire that others shall receive the same blessing. And as they make known the rich treasures of God's grace, more and still more of the grace of Christ will be imparted to them. Christ's Object Lessons, page 125. Christ's last act before leaving the earth was to commission his ambassadors to go to the world with his truth. His last words were spoken to impress the disciples with the thought that they held in trust the message of heaven for the world. If we but realized how earnestly Jesus worked to sow the world with the gospel seed, we, living at the very close of probation, would labor untiringly to give the bread of life to perishing souls. We have only a little longer time in which to prepare for eternity. The light which God has given to us as a people is not given that we may treasure it among ourselves. We are to act in harmony with the great commission given to every disciple of Christ to carry to all the world the light of truth. In Heavenly Places, page 317. Thursday, April 13, A Mission Movement To us has been committed a great work, the work of proclaiming the third angel's message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We have but few missionaries. From home and abroad are coming many urgent calls for workers. Young men and women, the middle-aged, and in fact all who are able to engage in the master's service, should be putting their minds to the stretch in an effort to prepare to meet these calls. If we consecrate mind and body to God's service, obeying His law, He will give us sanctified moral power for every undertaking. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 209. God calls upon every church member to enter His service. Truth that is not lived, that is not imparted to others, loses its life-giving power, its healing virtue. Everyone must learn to work and to stand in his lot and place as a burden-bearer. Every addition to the church should be one more agency for the carrying on of the great plan of redemption. The entire church, 
acting as one, blending in perfect union, is to be a living, active missionary agency. It is a law of heaven that as we receive, we are to impart. The Christian is to be a benefit to others, thus he himself is benefited. He that watereth shall be watered also himself. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 25. This is not merely a promise. It is a law of God's divine administration, a law by which he designs that the streams of beneficence shall be kept, like the waters of the great deep, in constant circulation, perpetually flowing back to their source. In the fulfilling of this law is the power of Christian missions. In Heavenly Places, page 317. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. These words of Jesus have lost none of their force. Our Savior calls for faithful witnesses in these days of religious formalism. But how few, even among the professed ambassadors of Christ, are ready to give a faithful personal testimony for their Master. Many can tell what the great and good men of generations past have done, and dared, and suffered, and enjoyed. They become eloquent in setting forth the power of the gospel, which has enabled others to rejoice in trying conflicts and to stand firm against fierce temptations. But while so earnest in bringing forward other Christians as witnesses for Jesus, they seem to have no fresh timely experience of their own to relate. You who profess to be proclaiming the last solemn message of mercy to the world, what is your experience in the knowledge of the truth and what has been its effect upon your own hearts? Does your character testify for Christ? Can you speak of the refining, ennobling, sanctifying influence of the truth as it is in Jesus? What have you seen? What have you known of the power of Christ? Without a living faith in Christ as a personal Savior, it is impossible to make your faith felt in a skeptical world. Gospel Workers, pages 273 and 274. For further reading, Reflecting Christ, Justified Souls Walk in the Light, page 78, and The Faith I Live By, A Savior from Eternity, page 76.